Welcome back to the Lion Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. For newcomers, this is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts on all the things in the realms of health and wellness and movement and drugs and sexuality and sorts of strange topics that somehow in a roundabout way relate back to your health. And today's conversation was with my homie, Jamie Kilstein, who is a professional comic. Uh, you may have seen him on the Joe Rogan podcast. You may know him from political conversations. You may know him from comedic conversations. Uh, this specific podcast, we get into all of those topics. And uh, it was a really good time. I hope you guys absolutely devour it. I've got a quote. This isn't actually a quote. This is paraphrased from uh, Russian philosopher Gurdjieff. I'm not sure if I say that correctly. I think it's Gurdjieff. I, and I heard this through uh, a Ram Das. Um, discourse. He was talking, reference Gurdjieff, and one of the things he said is that in order to achieve enlightenment, a person must first sacrifice their suffering. Uh, and uh, that's totally paraphrased. It's not at all. It's, the idea is uh, is what he was getting at, and, but that's not all what he actually said. Um, but I like the idea that we need to sacrifice our own suffering in order to reach higher levels of our own consciousness. What the hell does that mean? Um, I think oftentimes we can become trapped in our own victimhood because we have gained some degree of uh, success or safety or reward from being within that victim role. And, uh, as, and then we start to kind of carve out a home for ourselves within that, that victim role. And, uh, then it feels unsafe to leave that space. But beyond that, that, that new shell that we haven't accessed uh, is a new layer of freedom. But it can feel scary at first to leave our victimhood. Gurdjieff! The victim stuff is strange culturally as well because it's kind of like you're not really permitted to touch it from an outsider. You can't shake someone's victim cage up too much without uh, running the threat of, of receiving attack, not just from them, but from culture in general. Don't mess with somebody's victimhood. So potential homework for the week is, is there any place in your life that you have been holding on to this old, rusted out, crusty victim card that really is not supporting you any longer? And you might not even realize that you have that card. It might be stuffed deep into your waistband and it's just chafing your hips. And you just, you're so used to that chafe, you don't even realize it. That's a, that's a disgusting metaphor. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the website, Align Podcast. Dot com. Uh, on there, if you have interest, 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 interest in sorting out your neck pain, back pain, stiffness around your hips, your shoulders, uh, that's exactly what we get into in the first week of the Align Method online program, and it's totally mother flipping free. Alignpodcast.com. You can also find that in the bio uh, on my Instagram page at Align Podcast. Thanks for views. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for doing you. Here we go. Back to the podcast with a man, Jamie Motherflippin' Kilstein. Thanks for uh, jumping in the cold plunge with me. Do you, do you want to talk about how brave I was? You were, <laughs> you were I was such a brave little boy. Your chin looked like it was going to fracture. It was insane. <laughs> From the amount it of was, shivering that was happening. It was so bad. <laughs> I, uh, I, I literally was just like, just tell me when I can get out that I wasn't the person who left the earliest. No, it's good. Like, that's all I want to Typically, the strongest people oftentimes... The most boastful, strongest people I've seen have the most shameful cold plunge. Perfect. Times. That's jujitsu too. Whenever guys walk in and they're like way oh, bigger than right. me and they have like a tap out shirt, I'm like, oh, I'm going to fuck that guy up. And he's going to be so sad because I'm so small and vegan-ish and then he's going to quit. <laughs> How long have you been training jujitsu? 12 years in? Mm-hmm. What's that journey been like? Uh, I had to find something to balance. So I started stand-up when I was 17 and I dropped out of high school to start. And so sports was never a thing. Like I failed gym class. Um, and then people will go, 
you can't fail gym class. How do you fail? And I was like, you can. You just get stoned and you lie and you say you don't have shorts. And then mm. you just sit and you get high and you watch people playing Is that you dumb games with balls. Were and... like too insecure to do gym class things? I was insecure. Um, I think I was just lazy. Um, I wanted to be in a band, so I would always sneak away and like try to play the drums because like we couldn't afford drums, so I would just sneak and play like the school drum set. And uh, yeah, I was just super unathletic, but I always loved fighting. And so it got to the point where like martial art movies, like shit like that. And so it got to the point where I was so out of shape and unhealthy that when I would try to go to the gym, I was like, this is stupid. Or, you know, I never followed sports, so I couldn't, like, I didn't have, like, basketball role models or whatever. But I was like, I want to learn how to fight. So it was kind of my way to, like, trick myself into becoming an athlete, you know? Mm -hmm. So from, like, 18 to, like, 23, I did MMA. And then things got kind of big with stand-up. And I went on the road, and I got, like, just drugs and drinking and fast food and it was awful i got so out of shape and then one day i was doing a show in scotland at two in the morning in front of like four to six hundred very drunk people it was a showcase show so they weren't there to see me it was just random comics and i tried to do some like lefty abortion material stuff and they started uh booing uh, very loudly. Oh, man. And then I thought I would win them back by saying, there must be a misunderstanding. You guys must have just heard the joke wrong. Let me start again. And I started doing the exact same set that they were booing at. And they started screaming and standing up and throwing stuff. So security brings me off stage. And uh, How long ago was this? This was like 12 years ago. Oh, man. So, uh, so security brings me off stage. And this is the Did you think that was going to be effective or were you like... Being, no, I was being an asshole. You, I was you being were, an asshole. You were agitated. Yeah, so David Tell, who's one of my favorite comics, told me once, you either have a good show or a good story. Yeah. So when I was younger, like I was one of those guys where I'm like, oh, if it's not working, like if I'm doing average, then I'm just going to like burn it to the fucking ground well, and then get my good story. And now I'm like old and don't have time for that and want to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, but... So, yeah, no, I was, like, purposely riling them up. And so when the guy brought me off stage, this, like, big security guard, he had a big like, Scottish dude, he had, like, a beard down to, like, his, like, waist. And he was, like, um, I was, like, cocky. I was, like, I could have handled it. Like, and he's, like, I wasn't worried about them. He goes, I've never heard an audience shout such specific threats. Like, it wasn't like, we're going to kick your ass. It was like, they had a plan. Like, they knew what they wanted to do. Damn. And so, yeah, they escorted me out of the back of this, like, castle thing. And I was like, I should probably go back and learn how to defend myself. So I got home, got to New York, signed up for jiu-jitsu, was so out of shape that I threw up after the warm-ups and snuck out. And then I fell asleep at a Barnes & Noble for two hours, came back a week later, and then I've been doing it ever since. It was a very shameful origin story. It was like bombing in comedy. It's a not, well, okay, so it's a nightmare, but it's, I think one of the reasons that comics get really quote unquote offensive or will do shit like me and get an audience to boo or whatever is if you have one of those stories, it's sort of heroic. You know what I mean? Like I took on this audience, like they were being assholes. So I like doubled down. I like shoved this in their face. I made this guy walk out, you know, like I've made people walk from my show so many times. And when the crowd's on your side, it's great. They all cheer and they're like, yeah, fuck that guy. And he leaves. Um, what's your ratios? What's your, what's your, well now I've just been doing it so long and now my goal is to do good. So I usually do good. Oh, good. <laughs> what's, right. what's not good. And I think this is the reason that comics do get so aggressive and like offensive is silence silence is louder silence in a comedy club right. is louder than any noise you will ever hear mm. it is as an audience member it is it is just it is uncomfortable it is, everyone is just like stiff it is horrific as an audience member i kind of like it do you? Oh, sure. I love awkward moments. If they're being aggressive and like attacking the audience, I'll laugh and I think it's great. Like I've seen my all my favorite comics bomb. I've seen Bill Burr went on after me once and it ended with him getting a donut thrown at him. I think it's online. Um, I've seen Bill Burr bomb. I've seen CK bomb. I've seen Attel Chappelle, like all those guys. And it's great. As a comic, it's incredible. But like if you're going to see an average, let's say five years in, doesn't really know how to handle himself, makes a joke, it's silence, and then he's like, 
Okay. Um, well, have you ever, have you ever done that? Like, it's fucking horrible. It's hor- yeah. it's horrible. And so then I think the reason comics get so aggressive is because they would rather that heroic story of it's like a girl, right? It's like, well, I don't want to date you anyway. Like after they say no, and it's yeah. like, yes, you did. Like that's what they'll do to the audience. Well, they'll turn on the audience and they make it seem like. Oh, you know, you don't like me. I don't like you. Fuck you guys. And then so then they get super aggressive or offensive or whatever, because booing, oddly enough, it's better than silence because you're at least getting something. You're hearing something. People are engaged. Yeah. But to be indifferent and mediocre and just kind of like stand there in your own shame, is, is, it's terrible. Yeah. I, I haven't bombed like that in a, in a very long time. What is the recipe for recovery? <sighs> Sometimes it's acknowledging it. You know, if you do it in the right way, like you can get away with like maybe one or two, like, all right, that one didn't work. And then they laugh because they're like, thank you for acknowledging that it didn't work. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's completely changing gears. You know, I did my first sh- shows back since quarantine. And, you know, people always famous. Jerry Seinfeld famously talks about you don't want to open with new material. You want to open with proven stuff mm. or you don't want to be too controversial. And I opened with eight minutes on uh, the protests covid and uh tucson was currently on fire um like literally there were mountain fires um and i talked about all of those things but i didn't do it in a way where i was like shitting on people i did it in this like kind of like hey we're all in this together oh my god oh my god kind of way and it did great and it was super cathartic i think for everybody but there was just as good of chance that it would have tanked and so in my head, what I was going to do was just say something like, all right, now let's do real material. And then just open with like my most solid, like undeniable joke. And mm. if it didn't work, then the next show, I'm just not opening with that new stuff. Like yep. you can fuck around. You fuck around with like the order. And, you know, comedy is so weird because sometimes it's not the joke that doesn't work. Sometimes it's because this joke went after that joke. Sometimes I'll say a word differently and the joke kills. What's what's fascinating, and this is actually very like kind of zen, uh, be present. What's fascinating is, okay, so the opener, for example, that I did, a lot of it had to do with Arizona, but it did so well that my attic brain, because I have shows next week in Minneapolis, and my attic brain goes, oh, I want to open with that again in Minneapolis. But there is a great chance that even if I say this happened in Arizona, or I try to switch some things to make it relatable to Minneapolis, that... That was just what all of us in that room in Arizona were going through in that moment. And that joke may never exist again, yeah, which is sort of beautiful. Um, so, like, there'll be times where you improvise a line. Um, like, I riff a lot. So, like, I'll improvise the line and it gets a huge applause break. Biggest applause break of the night. Yeah. Then the next day you say that exact same line, exact same way, exact same intonation, exact same wording. And it tanks. And you're just like, I thought that was going to be like my new big, my new big thing. But it was just because something about the energy in that room, in that moment, or the audience could sense that it was legitimately coming off the top of your head. And like, we're all sharing this thing. And then you try to recreate it. And that other audience is like, nah. How much of comedy for most comics, you obviously couldn't speak for everybody, but from people that you speak with and yourself is like jujitsu in the sense that um, you're not going to go in with your you know, cool, I'm going to arm bar this person that I'm going to, right. you know, maybe start off. I'm a hip throw and maybe right, 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 right. And then, you know, blah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah. Versus like, okay, they did this. Now here's my response. Now they did that. Now here's my response. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so two things. So for people listening who maybe have not done jujitsu or boxing or anything like that, the reason you don't want to do that is because if, if, if Aaron and I are fighting, uh, which we wouldn't, he is much bigger than me. And I would be like, I forgot someone in my car. And I, would, <laughs> I would drive away. Um, <laughs> Um, the, uh, and I go, okay, when he punches me, I'm going to do this. When he punches me, I'm going to do this. When he punches me, I'm going to do this. And then he fucking blasts me with a leg kick. I'm done because I was just trying to plan it out in my head. That's why as weird as it sounds, you have to be very present, uh, when you're fighting. So with comedy, I, the only people I've been able to see that can just walk on stage with an idea and just talk about it are like, are Dave Chappelle and like... Louis C.K. Like literally like three of the best people in the world. But couldn't you have different bits that would be the, here's my answer yeah. into Kimura, here's my twister, here's my this. So the way I do it, so my safe way to improvise 
is I'll do a – I mean, if something happens – like last night something happened in the audience where like a girl was flirting with me. So I'm like, great. This is just a thing that's just going to happen. And we improvised and it was really funny. And did it she was, have a vagina? It was great. She did. Oh. She did. She did. Yeah. It was very <laughs> Moving on up. Um, yeah, yeah. I usually just look for vaginalists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was a, uh, there was one girl at the show who wooed, I think accidentally at the wrong time, Ooh. where I was talking about girls who like haven't come, or I said like if you, oh boy. and the girl like cheered, and I was just like, wait, <laughs> like it was such a sad moment. But anyway, so uh, uh, my theory, by the way, I won't do the bit because I'm not that comic, but I, my theory was that. Uh, uh, that if a girl does want to come a lot, she has to date a, a sad, needy guy. Because I was like, big fucking handsome guys don't like need it as bad as I do. Like I have so much validation. Yeah, you're going to take care of them. Yeah. I think yeah. the line I said was, uh, I'm not going to stop eating your pussy until my dad loves me. <laughs> <laughs> until I'm convinced my dad loves me. Oh, and then I said, I go, my tombstone's just going to read, cool, cool, but you came, That's right? Good. And like that was it. And uh, so you'll have like genuine, like, improv moments but for me like going up with just an idea if i go up with just an idea like i'm a pretty serious person even when i do podcasts like i'll do podcasts and they're like funny man jamie kilstein and i'm like institutional racism needs to be and they're like ugh um like i'm like pretty serious i'm pretty like self-hating and so the way i do it on stage is i have a joke that i know works right so i have my premise my setup my punchline and then if that joke kills that laughter gives me a little leeway to be like, all right, let's see if I can like add some tags, like add some lines to see if they work. And then if let's say one of those two lines work the next night, that line is no longer improv. I try to make that line part of the bit and then we can. So I use the laughter as kind of leeway to like see if there are other ways to explore. But there are certain comics that can just like get high and talk. And then for me, like I... I write a lot. So uh, if I have a premise, I really want to have at least like two ideas for good punchlines. I'm not just going to like riff because mm. I'm not like the funniest riffer. But if I'm killing, suddenly I become a funny riffer just because yeah, I have like total confidence. confidence. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does a person get funnier? <sighs> I mean, if you're asking, are you asking how to become a better comic? Like funnier on stage or funnier as like a human being? Random part. Do they have to like have to go back in time and impose some type of abuse into their life or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, you know what's <laughs> funny? I if only I was touched Dude, when I was... <laughs> I, I, ju I just said this to my sister because we were talking about this before the show. I'm starting to like rediscover my Hawaiian uh, roots because I, I very much had imposter syndrome because I don't look Hawaiian. Uh, like my dad is just like very Jewish and like that is what I got fucked into my body. Mm. Um, um, and my mom is like tan and beautiful and, um, but I'm starting to rediscover it and talking to my Hawaiian friends and family, I'm learning that a lot of stuff that is in me, uh, is very Hawaiian. This like idea of being like a steward to the earth or like speaking up against injustice or like even the whole storytelling culture was so huge in Hawaii. And yeah, I told my sister that the other day where I was just like, I literally thought I was only funny because of like our drama. Um, Cause that is what made me funny. Like every interview I've done, like where they're like, so were you the class clown? And I was like, no, the class clown beat the fuck out of me and called me gay and shoved me in a locker. And that's why I wrote like jokes in my notebook because I was like crying and sad and mm -hmm. bullied. Um, so a lot of people do become comics because of that. But the other thing is like, I'm funnier when I'm around funny people. Yeah, so if there are people who are like, they feel boring or they it's usually the people like if you're on a dating site and they just write like I'm the crazy funny one in a group. You're just like you're a nightmare. That just means you're drunk and you're loud and you're a fucking nightmare. Yep. Um, usually the funny people don't even really consider themselves funny. Um, there's a, a but it, it, if you have like a quiet nerdy person who like grew up watching the Simpsons and Monty Python or whatever, like chances are they're like really fucking funny and way funnier than they think they are. You mm. know, so I think it's just be around funny people um, or uh, watch funny things or, I mean, it's really just like, or you know what it usually is, man? It's have the balls to say the funny thing mm. because I think a lot of people have these weird, funny ideas, but they sit on them because they're like, that's weird. Like I'm much more attracted to a girl if they're like, ah, I'm just like kind of like a weirdo as opposed to like, I'm the funny one. It's like, no, the weirdo is probably the funny one, okay. but she thinks she's weird because she's suppressed that funny for so long. You know what I mean? Or a guy or whatever. Um, so I think it's also just 
make the joke. And if like I've been talking to so many people who listen to my podcast because like I talk about like depression and mental health and shit a lot. And they'll always talk about like I'm the weird one. But in that email, they make me laugh. They're like really vulnerable. They're empathetic. And I'm like, no, society has told you you're the weird one. But you're actually the kind of cool creative one who is sick of your day job, who wants to travel, who wants to do something adventurous, who has tried psychedelics, who um, sees things a little differently, who would defend a person on the street when the other people would walk away. Like it bums me out so much. Like the friends I've lost to suicide, like Robin and like people like that were so fucking cool and weird and kind and a lot of the people that i meet with depression and who have been suicidal which like me 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 me, on all of those too like they're actually really sweet and you want to be like no we need more of you like it's never like the cocky asshole who's like i'm gonna kill myself it's like no that guy's like fucking going to chirotherapy and vegan he's gonna live forever and you know um but it's the the weirdos who get so down on themselves and so sorry this went into such a weird place your question is like accept the weirdness and like own the weirdness and know that that's actually one of the most beautiful qualities in the world because the majority of people are kind of boring you know and i think it's just because they've been they've had creativity drilled out of them um you know, a lot of times the funny kids are like shut up in school or like medicated and they're like, oh, you must have ADD or like all this and stuff like that. And I was just really lucky where my family was fucked up enough that they kind of let me do my thing. And then, and it was a mess when I was in my twenties, but then it sort of matured into, you know, this like creativity, but we take creativity away from people. Or I think some people think, they have to focus solely on like making money and and getting this uh, picturesque house and you know whatever and 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 saying something uh, righteous on Facebook that the idea of like hey go take like a painting class or like learn guitar is so like my poor dad we just bought him guitar lessons online because he has wanted to do it for like fifty fucking years and he's been retired for like five years and like he has a guitar. And, like, people just feel like they can't take time to do that stuff. Yep. Um, so be weird. And then you find other weirdos. You find your tribe. Like, if they're like, oh, I tried to make a joke and everyone in the office gets weirded out. It's like, that might not be your tribe. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I probably couldn't date a girl who didn't grow up on, like, seasons, like, 4 through 12 of The Simpsons. That's just, like, my humor. Like, just that silly, weird humor. Um, so I don't know, man. I think it's just, like... I think most people are actually kind of funnier and cooler than they think they are. And they just dumb it down. I want to take a moment and thank a vital mineral referred to as magnesium for supporting our body in over 300 different critical reactions, including detoxification, fat metabolism, uh, energy production, and digestion. All of those are dependent on the presence of magnesium in our system. Big issue that happened with magnesium um, is it's in large part quite deplete in our soil that we're getting our vegetables, places that we would naturally get magnesium from. So it's been largely missing in the U.S. soil since the 1950s, uh, which would explain why estimated up to 80% of the population may be deficient in this stuff. Um, when you get many a supplement for magnesium, magnesium is literally one of the only supplements that I actually would purchase. A lot of the supplements that we end up spending big bucks on, um, stuff that we're going to probably just pee out anyway. Uh, magnesium, on the other hand, is something that uh, we're not going to typically be able to get from most diets because what you get from a vegetable or from an animal or what, what have you uh, is dependent upon what that vegetable or animal is consuming, i.e. the soil or the food that's going in the animal. And so if the soil is deplete of the mineral, then you are not going to get it on the consuming end. So we teamed up once again with our homies over at Bio Optimizers. You may know them from their probiotic supplements, which we have repped before in the past. I really like those guys as well. Uh, stand behind the company. I think they're great. And you can get yourself 10% off on their Mag Breakthrough, uh, which is a magnesium that includes all seven forms of the mineral and also includes something called monoatomic magnesium, which helps make all the other forms more bioavailable. If you'd like to get yourself a sweet discount on this stuff, give it a try. 
All you got to do is go to magbreakthrough.com slash align podcast. That's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough, B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H.com forward slash align podcast. From there, you can utilize the Align 10 discount code and you will get yourself a sweet 10% off of that stuff. I highly recommend you trying this. Uh, If you don't love it, you don't notice difference immediately, uh, they will give you a full money back guarantee. I am highly confident you guys are going to love this stuff and you have absolutely nothing to lose. So check it out. Once again, that is magbreakthrough.com forward slash Align podcast, M A G breakthrough b-r-e-a-k-t-h-r-o-u-g-h dot com slash online podcast all right back to the podcast with jamie kilstein Hmm. feels like that person that is the quintessential jock you know whatever all american person that you're describing yeah um it feels like that person compared to the other the other weirder folk uh, the jock person, it's almost like they are the boring version of that. Cause there's lots of different varieties of every individual, obviously. Yeah. Um, the boring version of that, they're just like in the game. Yeah. You know, they're like, they don't, they're not looking at the game beyond of like, Oh, this is just a fucking game. Right. Right. You know, right they're right. like, they're just fully in the game. Right. Yeah. You know? I and mean, then well, there's another layer where you can start to look at and be like, Oh, you guys realize you're playing a fucking game right now, right? Right, right, like, this right, is, right, This right. is like, there's rules, this is all made mm-hmm. up stories. Well, y- even what you said about the trauma thing, we're like, yeah, a lot of my humor came from like, because we had like addiction in our family, and so me and my brothers would just use humor to like survive, like as like terrible shit was like, go, like burning around us. Um, but also, when you said the game thing, I thought of this, where it was kind of like, like every fucking artist or thing, like girls. Where I'm like, oh, I'm not good looking enough to get girls, so how can I make girls notice me? I was yeah. like, well, I have to be funny, or I have to be smart, or I have to, uh, like... You gotta get those dick BBs like they do in India. I gotta get those dick BBs. Have you I ever get... seen that? Once I get the dick BBs, I'll finally be able they to get lace, a girl with a vagina. They lace, they, yeah. <laughs> so, have is... you ever seen that? No. They lace BBs into their their stuff. Really? Yeah, we'll check it out on the YouTube afterwards. Okay. Yeah. This is definitely <laughs> for greater guys. Pl- I'm just gonna pleasure. tell you before the show, we were taking ice baths while listening to "Kiss from a Rose" by Seal, Seal and yeah, Aaron was like, "How are you doing?" And I was like, "This is exactly what I thought hanging out with you was gonna be." Yeah. And now watching YouTube dick BB videos, yeah, I was like, "Yep." Yeah, yeah. Now we've clicked we're, off all the boxes. We're, we're in that was the last box we haven't checked off <laughs> is the YouTube Seal. dick BB, and now the uh, the yeah, now we've got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but comedy jujitsu, and I also think that like. It's funny. I didn't start meditating till this year and trying to focus more on my health till this year. But there is, even when I was like a fuck up and all over the place, even comedy and jujitsu, they're, you know, they're fun things that you think about, you know, every 16 year old boy or girl would want to do. Um, but they also require you to be very present. Mm. Um, you know, I need to be aware of just like in jujitsu, I have to be aware of like threats. Like what's that guy doing with his hands? Where is he putting his energy? Like, is he pissed? Is he flowy? Is he waiting for me to make a move so we can counter whatever? It's the same with comedy. You're not just telling jokes. You're listening to like, okay, that table's starting to talk a little bit on the left. If I give them eye contact, that could, you know what I mean? Like you're reading everybody in the room. There's yeah. like wait staff. There's all this stuff. Like you have to be like, oh, I tag that. I want to remember that to write that down. And like, if they didn't like this joke, maybe I'll skip this and I'll reorder this. But like, you have to be like very, very present while you're doing all this like, um, like, uh, like mechanic work, like in your brain. Um, and in a weird way, like, I think that was me still trying to find some form of presence even when my life was chaos where like I never thought about meditating. I never thought about psychedelics. I never thought about that. But I think everybody still craves that that moment where you're not freaking out about the past or the future. And so that's what I found in like stand up and jujitsu. And so now this year or last year when I finally started to meditate and I had our friend Emily on my podcast um which one emily fletcher mm -hmm. oh yeah she's lovely and she's so great and that line she has where she says uh you're not meditating to be a good meditator you're meditating to be like good at life or whatever i was like oh and then uh yeah all that presence from my years of getting fucking booed in scotland and like beat up by ufc fighters finally i was like okay i can like meditate now and chill the fuck out Mm. yeah that's so i wonder with you something that i've heard from multiple people is like not wanting to 
sober up or having concern of maybe using psychedelics or yeah um anything that would be in the in the the camp of like progressive enlightening whatever you know whatever words uh, a, a certain concern of of like losing their funny yeah i'm so uh, yeah i'm glad you brought this up because i don't have an answer and it's going to be me being like help me um this is something i battle with so much and I think for me, part of it has to do with like confidence where I just need to be confident that whether I'm sober or drunk or healthy or not or depressed or happy that I can be a funny comedian. Right. And it's just like my writing, my experience, I can be funny. Um, but when I was living in L.A., dude, and I was like really all in jujitsu, like training twice a day, I even started like helping out, like teaching like classes just because I wanted to do something that seemed semi charitable besides like yelling at Twitter. Um I remember doing my first show. I, I didn't do stand up for like a couple months. And then I did. There was just some killer show I got asked to do at the comedy store where it was like fucking everyone. It was like Rogan, uh, like Russell Peters, Joey Diaz. Like it was everybody, everybody, everybody. And so I did the show and went great. Couldn't have gone better. Like there was like a musician I liked in the audience. Like he came up after. Like Rogan was being cool. It was like, again, the best. And I'm walking back to my car and I started being like, like literally, like I felt like a 16 year old succumbing to peer pressure where I was like, all right, I guess I got to like start drinking again. And then there was part of me that I even thought to myself, and this may be super weird and esoteric, but I even thought to myself, um, well, I guess I'm going to go back to like being depressed because those were always like, I talk about mental health a lot with the goal to help people and with the goal to be like, have them be like, I'm not alone, blah, blah, blah. But there's another side to that where if you just tweet self deprecating, I'm a piece of shit tweets, those tweets do very well. Mm. But if you tweet like just fucking killed a good workout, Nate healthy, everyone's like, boo, <laughs> like it, it's not, they want to vicariously uh, live through your bad habits because that gives them permission to continue their bad habits. Um, Which permission can be valuable i think yeah if you're only living in the i'm awesome side of the oh. spectrum that's also oh, deceptive and yeah it could be considered a form of violence i would say both are bad i mean that's yeah. why i think like what you do is really important like being able to be like humble and talking about when you fuck up or things you're working on but the goal is to improve whereas comics and with comedy the goal sometimes is to yeah like stay miserable because that's what people like watching they do like watching a miserable person on stage rant or talk about you know i mean the things i even talk about now that get the biggest laughs are like disastrous stories about like things that have happened to me um and so it's tough man i mean there are definitely some good examples now and Rogan has to do with this about like, you know, talk, like comics who are very successful talking about being healthy and working out and stuff like that. But you go on the road, even the shows I did this weekend, like every comic wants to drink with you. And then like girls want to buy you drinks in between shows. And, you know, people are still doing drugs like it was like the 80s. Um, but I've never heard someone be like, I'm afraid to do psychedelics because that'll make me like enlightened and happy and I won't be funny. Like to me, psychedelics have actually made me far braver on stage mm. and braver with just being like, I'm going to talk about the things I want to talk about and I'm not going to think about what other people think. I'm just going to do it and find my audience that way. Um, that was the same with the podcast. I, the podcast used to be political and I was like miserable. And so I just wanted to talk about mental health and coming together with people and like my fuck ups and their fuck ups. And so like I changed the name, I lost listeners cause this is the best time to have a political show right now. We're very divided. Yep. Even on the left, the left is very like divided between like mainstream Biden people and then more of the like, why do you think we're so divided right now? <sighs> I think we've always been divided, uh, to a certain extent. Um, although back in like my dad's day, like it was like uncouth to talk about even who you voted for. Do you remember that? Yeah, or, like sure, our parents like wouldn't say like who you vote for. It was very just you. I think there's still some of that. A little bit. I but people don't want to be judged. Well, now it's people don't want to get canceled. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's social media. I think social media and the media rewards it. When I was getting a ton of followers and celebrities were retweeting me, it's when I was like fucking going after people. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I started trying to like have conversations. Uh, with people who disagree with me, um, the left especially would have none of that. Hmm. And, you know, Rogan gets that. 
Rogan's had Bernie Sanders on, uh, and Rogan's has also had Alex Jones on, but the left will call him like alt right, yeah. like just straight up alt right, and so. I think that's really dangerous territory. Um, but again, that's what you get rewarded. You get rewarded if you're canceling people. You get rewarded if you're yelling at people. You I get think people rewarded. People just want to feel, you know. So if you yeah. call Rogan alt right, there's like, ugh, there's like yeah. a visceral, like, okay. Like, well, and not only that, I'm here and I, I mean, created a reaction, and there was a response, and then yep, somebody yep. talked about it on a podcast. Well, and like, that was part of like I'm 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 in the world, dude. I can tell you when I was doing that, I was in a failing marriage. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was unhealthy. I was living in New York. Um, I was uh, fucking miserable. But I would go online and I would see what people were mad about that day. I wouldn't even read the article. You just read the headline because you have to like blast your tweet out faster than other people. And then I would tweet it. And even if it was something I believed in, which oftentimes, like all the time, I hope it was, I would just sit there refreshing and being like, oh, quest love favorite. Or like, you know, and like, or retweet it and be like, oh, I'm getting more favorites or oh, I got these followers or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it becomes super addicting. And so, and it was making up for my lack of connection in the real world. Mm-hmm. I was getting it online, but it was just sucking me in like fucking quicksand, just like deeper and deeper. I was actually thinking about it today where I think that like Twitter is essentially an alternate reality where you are trying to ruin people. And in that sense, it's sort of like the anti-psychedelic where it's this like world that's like real, but it's like kind of not real, except instead of bringing everyone together, it's just like you're going there to like tear people down and like attack, attack, attack. It's almost mm. like, you know, like a virtual reality, whatever. It's kind of the same analogy as what you were saying before. If a quiet room is the loudest room you can be in for yeah. a comedian. I feel like it's similar with, with people that they just – Perhaps in part the the bipartisan divisiveness is just to create friction and noise because it yeah. feels there's something that feels more comforting yeah. with having it being in a fire yeah. and having something to fight yeah than yeah it just yeah being yeah like, okay well the birds are chirping this is um, well, fucking boring and and yeah and and, <laughs> and 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 that's the thing is when you go outside you're fighting on Twitter and you're like God we're gonna have a fucking civil war and then I moved from LA to Arizona. And, you know, so I assume I have conservative friends now and like, I don't know because we talk and when we disagree about stuff, we're not trying to showcase our skills for the world on Twitter. I'm just going like, oh, I used to like think we should get rid of all guns, but you're like a cool dude and you have a gun. Can you teach me about it? And then they'll go, sure. And then they teach me about it and then they see I'm open minded. So then I go, hey, out of curiosity, because you know more about guns than I do, what do you think we should do about like mass shootings? And then I get to learn from someone who has experience with guns. And then the next time I go talk to someone who's like very like pro gun, like we need to arm teachers, even though like they can't afford fucking bullets, uh, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, then I get to go, hey, I was talking to my like gun owner buddy and like he thinks we should have like stronger background checks. And the guy's like, I kind of have some cred now. Because I was talking to that guy. So I still think these conversations, these political conversations are really important and you shouldn't become apathetic. But I think that like if we think that all of these fights we see on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram comments represent the real world, I think we're very wrong. And not only that, but when all we care about is representing our team on social media and we're not listening to the other people and we're just screaming, you're never going to get solutions either. So if you actually care about the issues... Like I joked about this, uh, I think I said this on someone's podcast, but it, a good analogy of like who I was as a human. Like I was ignoring the people around me so I could be righteous online. Like I would be the guy who if someone was like, Jamie, your mom's on the phone, I'd be like, tell her I can't talk. I'm tweeting about feminism. You know what I mean? Like I'm ignoring the actual women in my life. Whereas now I'm not yelling on Twitter, but like. I'm doing more for charity. I'm donating more money. I'm talking to my mom every week. I'm like, you know, like I'm a better fucking human being. Yeah. But, um, you know, and we were talking about this. You get sucked into this. If you're not screaming on Twitter every day, then you're like a bad person. It's like, well, I would rather do something that actually how like I'll show solidarity so people know where I stand online. But like fighting with racists in the comments section i'm like i'm not really helping like stop systemic oppression by doing that i would rather like go help a cause or do I something think so many know? of the things that people are like taking a stand for oftentimes they're using the very same tactics that they're standing against yes 
Yes. Well, you know what's <laughs> crazy? Like, hold you on. Like, what? You, know what's, How? you can't. <laughs> a great example of that, that someone, uh, I wish I knew who it was. Some random, per- some person who follows me on Instagram wrote me this, where I wrote something very tame, where I was literally like, Black Lives Matter. Like, not like I wasn't like, kill whitey. Like, I was like, Black Lives Matter. And someone goes, uh, oh, you're just fucking virtue signaling. And then somebody pointed out to me that him saying that I'm virtue signaling is him virtue signaling to his people. Yeah, of course. And so, and, and, and the same thing where it's like the left or the, the, the you know, people will be like, oh, this person is triggered by that uh, on the left. But then something upsets the right. Suddenly, you know, the right's mad about masks. And it's like, well, they're being triggered about that. And we're all just like lobbing these hyperbolic balls of shit at each other and instead of and we're doing the exact same thing like the exact same tactics you're 100 percent right and then we just never get to talk and actually find solutions and part of me wonders i don't even know if these fuckers want solutions or if they're just going online to get their dopamine hits screaming people and shouting. just want to feel like they're a part of something they want to feel heard so many people feel unheard in their life and feel disempowered in their life and yeah. feel totally out of control and so if you can create some semblance of some something that just feels like there's some meaning. Right. Right. You know, even right. if it's inherently completely meaningless. I, I think the an interesting kind of um test to do for that that I'll kind of uh, the filter that I'll see comments and such through. Oftentimes I think the more vehemently kind of just like aggressive, angry, any of that stuff, um when people are defending a certain thing, it's kind of like when someone really goes out of their way, their way to tell you they're not gay. Right. 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 <laughs> you know, right, like, right. Dude, it's okay. You're like, we can kiss. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. so when someone comes at you, you're like, I don't even, I don't think what I said was yeah. even really alluding to yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. you're like coming at me. Right. I feel like there's something there for you. Like my, maybe my we fa- could talk about my it. My favorite line I've heard someone say to me once, and it was them trying to be progressive, but it still had that where they were like, I'm cool with gay people, Marion, as long as they're not trying to suck my dick. And I was like, did a gay guy try to suck your dick? Like, when did this happen? Yeah. Like, when is this like, when is this like a, a, a problem you face on like a day to day basis? But no, you're right, dude. <laughs> there is such, um, online is pretty much you're just like projecting your insecurities oh yeah we're always telling each other like you cannot hide when you are posting something that's insincere or saying something that is insincere you are you're projecting that insincerity out and a a more like a a tuned person Mm -hmm. is able to see through that and they can see behind that it's like you're never not sending messages of truth even if it's yeah. complete outright lies. this is another reason that your podcast our friend kyle kingsbury like that kind of crew has really saved me a lot because i feel like there's something about athletes where and even like i don't know what you call it like spiritual like psychedelic people enlightened whatever um where it's like okay to change your mind like yeah. there's something about social media, especially in the political world, even to a degree in comedy, where if suddenly you change your mind on something, people will attack you for that. Where they go, well, you used to say this. You're just uh, in politics. They call it the term is like they say you're a grifter. Mm. They're like, oh, so now he's like more centrist. I thought he used to be like a liberal. And to me, I think that's a really good thing. Like watching you totally. with the whole like Black Lives Matter thing was super interesting because it was just you being like yeah, I didn't post about this. I should figure out how I feel about this. And it was you like willing to kind of like go back. And even with like some of the COVID conversations, it was you trying to figure out what is going on and how you feel instead of I'm going to figure out how I feel in the very beginning. I cannot change my mind or else people will come after me and I'm just going to scream at anyone who disagrees. It was kind of this yeah. like me and my audience together are going to figure this out and I want to get different points of views. And that is like very fucking rare. And I, I, I think I remember during the John Kerry, George Bush election when John Kerry, I thought John Kerry was going to smoke him. Cause I'm like, Oh, you have a dude who was like a war hero fought in Vietnam. But then after he served came back threw his medals, protested the war. And I was like, great. He's got, he's got it on both sides. He was the tough guy who fought and then he like stood his ground. And then George Bush was like, he's a flip flopper. And everyone's right. like, yeah, he's a flip flopper. And I was just like, holy shit. And that was the first time I saw rhetoric and just like a, a, a line like that, just rock the entire system. And, 
maybe ever since then, this whole idea of changing your mind, which is essentially evolution, it's evolving as a human being, it's growing, taking in new information and becoming better off for that. It's something very good that we should all strive to change our minds. I would love to change my mind. I would love to learn uh, new things and evolve and open my mind and whatever. Um, now it's seen as like a real negative. And I also think that's why people get so fucking nuts online because I think there are a lot of Trump supporters who think that a lot of shit Trump does is fucking dumb. And I think there are a lot of liberals who think that a lot of shit that like, I don't know, fucking Antifa or whoever uh, does is fucking dumb. But everyone is so afraid to say anything that kind of goes against their team. And let's say you're a Trump supporter. You're essentially being called a racist and a Nazi every day online by liberals. Does that give you the motivation to say, hey, I really didn't like this thing Trump said? It's like, no, you want to double down and defend your guy because you're getting so much shit for it. Yeah. And same with the left. Suddenly it's like, you know, look, Black Lives Matter and the looters are very, 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 very different. Um, I just need to be incredibly clear about that. Uh, and most of the looters were like these like spoiled little fucking bored white kids. Um, I'm a huge supporter of Black Lives Matter. I wonder what the percentages were of people that were looting, if there was some way to get the demographic. I wish there ages. was. I wish there was. I mean, where it was dangerous and what I can definitely say is when they were conflating the protesters who were like, please don't murder black people with like the people throwing Molotov cocktails or whatever. I can say that I saw a lot of videos of black people stopping little white Antifa kids being like, we're going to get blamed for this. What the fuck are you doing? And I can also say that when I was down at Occupy Wall Street way back in the day in New York City um, or like the Trayvon Martin rallies and stuff like that, it was... I mean, shit, the black people were afraid to do anything out of line because they're the ones who are going to get the shit kicked out of them by the cops. Um, and it was a lot of these, like, spoiled little white uh, agitators who would, like, come in, throw shit, like, book away. They were called the black block back in the day. And now it's a lot of the black people. I if there was any provocateurs, if there was any hired help I think to, there was. To, to stimulate some type of eruption. I think there was for sure. I mean, I've seen cops do that at Occupy. Like, people, <laughs> my favorite story of all time was back do you remember the days when we were afraid of muslims instead of black people ah the good old days uh post 9 11 uh muslims were the enemy and there were a lot of fbi like infiltrators um who would go in undercover to these like mosques into these uh muslim communities yep and a lot of times they would make arrests and then there was that whole kind of questionable where it would be like me, I would find, you know, some like weird, young, awkward 19 year old virgin and kind of recruit him as an FBI agent and then, you know, get him to plan an attack with me. I say, hey, I'm going to provide you with the weapon, stuff like that. And then he gets arrested. And so there's the moral question, which I don't really have an answer for, which is, well, but would that guy have done it without being egged on by the cops, without the cops supplying them with the information or was that guy a bad guy and maybe they were actually stopping someone who would have grown up we don't know but my favorite story is there's one i believe it happened in upstate new york the fbi agent was so shady and trying to get these mosques to like commit crimes and terror attacks whatever that the mosque called the fbi on the FBI agent, because they didn't know he was an FBI agent. He was mm-hmm. an undercover. Mm-hmm. Called the FBI, and they were like, we have someone in our mosque who keeps trying to get us to commit terrorist attacks, Whoa. and we do not want to commit terrorist attacks. You have to arrest this guy. And it was fucking their dude on the Damn. inside. He was just being a maniac. So, it's like the same thing we're talking shit on in uh, social media. It's like, well, that's also the people that run the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, I that's honestly... above, so below, bitch. It, 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 sounds, it sounds so cliche (laughs) but every cliche i'm learning in my old age like all the answers are hidden in cliches right like i have for so long heard because i've been like codependent relationship jumper for so long heard like you have to love yourself before you love anyone i'm like shut up i am lonely and uh, now i'm alone for the first time and i'm like oh they were right and you know the when it comes to politics I know a lot of people who are really depressed right now, and some of them are depressed for really good reasons, where they see businesses shutting down, they see their black friends really scared, they see you know uh, everyone fighting in their family and screaming about politics, and like my dad's suddenly on Twitter, he was never on Twitter before, and he's just sending me all these angry articles about Trump, and you know I agree with my dad, but I see him getting miserable, even though we're on the same side politically, and um, 
And then there are some people who are depressed because if you're staring at your phone no matter what, you're going to be sad. You're not getting actual connection. And what I, the cliche advice, which is when you can take care of yourself on the inside, you will be so much more equipped to take care of shit on the outside where it's like, there's so much stuff you don't have control over, you know, like during quarantine where I was like, okay, I can have the narrative of I'm single for the first time in my life. <laughs> like, dude, my life was bad before quarantine happened. Like before quarantine happened, like my girlfriend left, my cat died in like the same fucking week. Like it was awful. And I could have had this like, fuck it mentality and instead i'm like all right this is like the ultimate test i'm alone for the first time what is everything healthy that i've wanted to do that i didn't do because i was in a relationship well i want to wake up at five i want to meditate every day i want to do jujitsu i want to read more i want to blah 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 blah. and the second i started doing all that stuff suddenly when it came to talking to people i disagree with about politics when it came to even digesting the information i'm getting about what's happening in the world around me i was just in such a fucking better place to, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was the voice of reason instead of the reactionary screaming, you know, just one of the people yelling on the internet. And it's just because I'm confident and happy. And like you were saying, like, I don't need to lash out at someone to feel because like my day to day feels good. So I'm like, if I'm going to go online or if I'm going to jump into politics, I'm either going to do it to help people. Like, look, I posted a lot about Black Lives Matter. I did a couple comedy videos on Instagram because I have a lot of jujitsu followers and I had like 30 to like 50 black people who I don't know write me on Instagram and they're like, thank you so much for talking about it. Like a lot of people in jujitsu weren't talking about it and it makes me feel not alone or seen. Um, and so for me, it's like, that's why it's important to say something. But the old me would have started like screaming at people in the comments and I'm like that I'm not going to engage in. Um, I'll either block you or if I, if, if I think you're saying something in good faith and maybe I can change your mind or help you or educate you, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, but I'm not going to just fight to get attention and to get likes and to make it about me. Cause I'm happy now. I'm confident. Whereas before I would have done it because I'm like, oh, feed any like attention I, I, I need. Um, I'll post the shit, uh, to be like solidarity, got your back. I'm here if you need me. But then, yeah, I'm not going to start fighting because uh, that doesn't fucking help anybody. I was or... listening to a thing from, from Lil John, and, uh, he's actually quite, he seems, he's got a good head on his shoulders yeah, from what for I've, sure. I've gathered. Um, and he hasn't, when he mentioned this thing, I haven't, I don't like follow his, his stuff really. I just saw one video of it and he was saying that he's not really active with, um, I think the, the BLM specifically stuff, yeah. but in general, his take is he's not active with a thing on social media or whatever, unless he's active with it in his life. I like that a lot. You know, so like it's like there's lot. so many people that, and there, there's a, a term for this in uh, exercise, actually. It's called, it's a Japanese term. It's called, oh, it's in my book. I forget what it's called, but essentially with the, with the if, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll, I'll like I'll put in the show notes. Um, but sometimes people will exercise a lot. They'll do a CrossFit workout or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then they'll have that or they'll do their little diet shake thing. Yeah. And then they'll be like, cool, like I did fitness. Right. And then the rest of the day, they're, 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 they're a piece of shit. Right, right, right. Because they did that load yeah. of like, oh, cool, I did that sweet fitness, yeah. now fuck my life. Well, confession, right? Like church confession. Like I'll go confess and then I'll just go be like. Right, exactly. Uh, well, it's because I did the rest that. Of the week. Yeah, 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 So yeah. It's, it's like, if it, it's, it's kind of, I think there's some of that same exercise oh. effect that happens to people with yeah. social media where like. For the record, when I was hanging out with like only liberal journalists, like all the people who were like canceling you if you're not like woke enough or progress enough all those motherfuckers were white mm. they were all white like it was like the staff of the nation like we were drinking in like park slope brooklyn down the street from the co-op it was like a bunch of spoiled white kids yeah um it wasn't until i did jujitsu really that i started like actually hanging out with like people of color and shit like that um and i think like <sighs> right now it's so easy to get caught up in all of the politics of it, like who's running that? Who did this? Should I trust that group? Should I? And I think it comes down to being as simple as like, when you see injustice, fucking speak up. Um, you should be able to say looting is bad and racism is bad and murder is bad and black people shouldn't have to fear for their fucking children and stuff like that. Um, but when you're only on Twitter, 
everyone just becomes obsessed with, you know, the new trendy story of the day or who we're mad at and this. And they're looking for like little ways to like outwoke each other. And it just becomes really silly. And we lose the bigger issue of talking about like what the actual problem is. I think right now, if you went to the majority of people, like, is it fair that black people have to like fear for their life from people who should be protecting them? It's like, well, only like a terrible person would say no, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, but when you when 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 you're screaming at each other on Twitter, it's like none of that shit. Like my 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 biggest pet peeve is when um you'll you'll post about you know oh my god this like black guy was just this innocent black guy was just killed by this cop and someone will jump in your comments and look well what about black on black crime and you go right that's bad too are you doing something to stop black on black crime or are you just bringing that up right now? to silence this story because it makes you uncomfortable, you know, or like, um, uh, if you talk about like a woman who was like sexually assaulted, they go, well, men are raped too. And you're like, yeah, that's very bad. Are you doing something about that? Yeah. Or are you just saying this to silence that woman? And that's when it's like so much of these online fights are just fucking disingenuous. People just want to shut down conversations that they don't like, you know, like I remember when I posted the, Black Lives Matter thing. Someone was like, oh, I came here for jujitsu and comedy. And I'm like, oh, we found the real victim of the George Floyd case. The guy who doesn't get jujitsu comedy for a day for free. Right. It's like, fuck off. Um, but. And it, they also, I think, have some degree of a point in the sense, not that guy specifically, but like uh, I've come to, and we got we to wrap this thing up, but mm-hmm. I've, I've come to a point where I'm acknowledging, I'm much quicker to inspect myself for being the problem that yeah. I'm like interested in combating. And that's, and, and so just having that like regular audit of like, okay, do, do I actually know what the fuck I'm talking I about? Do, but that's why I like you so much. And that's why I like, I think that's really important. And that's also why I stopped, you know, I stopped talking about it because I'm like, okay, I did the thing. I showed solidarity. I made some good points. I let people know they weren't alone, but now and this is what I used to do, which was bad. If I get sucked into it and I'm fighting every day and I'm making it about me, it's like, well, now it's about me. And now am I really helping mm, at all? Just another noise maker. Yeah. And so like with you and I think with me, it's like, okay, what I'm good at doing is I'm good at making people laugh about sad, hard shit. And so I'm going to go back to doing that. And if something else huge happens and I need to speak up, like, I'll do it. Like, you're really good at getting people to, like, take care of themselves and be introspective and be healthy. And that's really important. Like, uh, I think I said this to you off the air, but I'll say it on the air. Like, you really, your show, like, got me through um, all the COVID stuff, I Mm. think, especially since I was alone for the first time. I think I totally could have gone into fucking panic mode or whatever. And it really helped. So it was really important. So, like, do we need you now every day? And like Black Lives Matter t-shirt, yeah, like, like posting your thoughts. You f- so I wouldn't freak out about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, you want to like freak out about it or you like, you know, figure out how you feel about it. It's a big, important thing that's happening. Yeah. Say it, see how you can help. If you can't help, peace out. And if you can not help, cool, do that. Um, but again, cliches, I think it comes down to just like, don't be a dick, be nice to people. Mm. And like, that's kind of it. Mm. Thanks, man. Yeah. Oh, can I horn my podcast? Out? Thing. Yeah, of course. Or um, if you guys, my new non political podcast, um, it's called A Fuck Up's Guide to Self Help, um, which, uh, yeah, it's just this really awesome community of people who are trying to be better, but will, myself very much included, uh, talk about when uh, we fuck up, how to pick ourselves up. And uh, it's a comedy show. It's free. It's on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. And then, um, guys, get me off Twitter. Twitter's where I'm like verified and I yell politically and it's a cesspool um but i started making funny videos on instagram so i'm at the jamie kilstein on instagram so follow me there and unfollow me on twitter (laughs) yeah yeah i don't know i don't understand the twitter world i don't think i'm intelligent enough with little like quips to have meaningful value i'm not great with it i need at least four good sentences yeah yeah i'm the same (laughs) i'll get better i'll just go there all right cool thanks buddy this is awesome i appreciate it thank you this is great 
Thank you all so much for tuning in to that podcast conversation with my man, Jamie Kilstein. I really enjoyed that one and I hope you guys got value. If you did, you can share some little tidbits on the Instagram. It's a great place. You can tag me at Align Podcast or Jamie at Jamie Kilstein. And um, thank you guys so much for leaving reviews for this program on the Apple Podcast or wherever the heck you do it at Spotify. Uh, really great stuff. I read them all and I love it. Uh, if you guys have of interest in learning a little bit about some fundamental breathing practices that you can integrate into your daily life to calm your nervous system down or pep you up like you're drinking a cup of coffee or whatever, matcha, ginseng, ginkgo biloba, uh, you can check out the first week of the Align Method online program. Totally free, no strings attached. Jump in that thing, learn about how to breathe, learn about how, how to get your body right, and bam! It feels good. People have been loving that, and I appreciate that. Uh, that's can be found at alignpodcast.com. You can also find the link for it in my notes or the uh, bio at my Instagram page, Align Podcast. All right. I will see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for doing you. Bye now.